Bowers were there. Matt Finn popped over. Guy and Barb Curtis came over to laugh at us. No, came over to help us. Uh, but we had a really fun time. It was fun doing it together. Um, wanted to thank Julian and Katie and their family for taking all of the donations. And thank you to the church. In short order, we got a bunch of donations together that they delivered up there to Fire Country, the campfire area last Monday, and it's sweet to be a part of that and to assist. We know firsthand from last year how devastating the fire was in this area, and even more so up there, so we'll continue to pray, but we're so thankful for the rain the Lord sent this week to put out the fires, and now they're contending with other challenges too, but continue to be in prayer for all the many people impacted by these fires. Well, God bless you guys. Our children are dismissed. Our youth group is staying in. They want to hear from uh, Cowboy Jesse. Now, the youth group knows Matt's been sharing with them some stories about Cowboy Jesse from his youth, but we have a real treat today. Jesse Fenn is with us. He's back for Thanksgiving with his family and has come to deliver a message to us this morning. And we, we know Jesse, but this is Matt and Laura's eldest and uh, Grace's brother, Tim, Noah, and Will's brother, and so dear to us, and we're thankful for how the Lord has called you and your training that's taking place in seminary, the Master's Seminary in Southern California, studying for a Master's of Divinity degree, and you're going to be graduating on, in fall of next year, right, fall of next year. So we're honored and blessed, Jesse, that you would come and share a message from Scripture we are so looking forward to this. So I'm going to invite you forward now and thank you in advance. But we love you, brother. Thanks for coming this morning. Get this out of your way. Okay, thanks, Jimmy. God bless you. <laughs> Morning, guys. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you to Pastor Jerry and to all of you for, for having me. Happy Thanksgiving to you all. Uh, you might be able to tell I'm kind of getting over a cold, so uh, you might have to kind of bear with me a little bit. I can assure you that I feel a lot better than I sound. You know, I sound a little bit congested. Uh, if you guys have your Bibles with you today, I'm going to invite you to open up to Psalm 113. Psalm 113. And as you turn there, I'm going to kind of set the stage for this passage by telling you guys a story about the time I encountered President Obama. And I use that word encounter very intentionally because I have to be clear, I didn't exactly meet the president. Uh, actually, what happened was I was in college at the time. I was in San Francisco, and I was going to work. And as many of you might know, in San Francisco, if you're lucky enough to find a parking space, you might have to walk like 20 miles to get to where you actually need to be. So I found a parking space, and I had to walk several blocks. And I was about to cross the street. I was about to cross Bay Street, busy street in San Francisco. And I was stopped by a police officer on a motorcycle. He motioned me to stop. Another police officer came up, and they blocked the roads so that no one could cross Bay Street. And what followed was something that I will never forget for the rest of my life. <clears throat> Anywhere from 10 to 15 motorcycles, police motorcycles, came through, sirens just blaring. They were followed by another 10 or 15 police cars, Crown Victorias, SUVs, sirens blaring. And I looked up in the sky, I saw three helicopters, and I knew, I knew from the minute I saw the first set of motorcycles going through that this could only be one person. This had to be the President of the United States. And sure enough, following all the, this whole train of police cars came through three identical armored limousines. They each had two flags, the United States flag and what I found out later was the presidential flag. So the President would have been in one of those cars. They came through another 10 or 15 police cars, 10 or 15 motorcycles, went all the way through their sirens, and then the two uh, police officers who had stopped me originally got back on their bikes and drove through. And as I reflect back on that experience, that, that brief encounter, I think to myself, wow, so close and yet so far. <laughs> for, for a split second there, I was literally 15 feet away from the President of the United States, maybe the most powerful man in the world and yet, in a lot of ways, I feel closer to him when I watch him deliver a State of the Union address on TV. Because separating us in only those 15 feet was 
armored cars and police officers and motorcycles and helicopters and probably snipers on rooftops and <laughs> the National Guard and the US military and who knows what else. I was 15 feet away from him and yet, I, I don't, in another sense, I've never been so distant to someone in my entire life. And that tends to be how our world operates. With power tends to come distance. With prestige tends to come distance. That's why security is a huge industry. That's why there's such a thing as bodyguards and personal bodyguards. Because with power tends to come distance. And I tell you that because the God that Psalm 113 is going to present to us is a God who is exactly the opposite. This is a God who is transcendent and yet imminent. God who is sovereign and yet compassionate. This is a God who is powerful and yet tender and merciful. I'm going to read this psalm for you guys. You can follow along. Um, I happen to have a ESV Bible with me today. Feel free to follow along in whatever version you have or what's on the screen. Uh, so I'm going to read these nine verses for us. It says this, Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Uh, just a couple of quick comments before we <clears throat> really jump into this psalm. First, uh, this psalm is one of six psalms. It's a, the first of a group of six psalms in the Bible known as the Egyptian Hillel Psalms. And these songs were sung at the Passover to commemorate the Passover, to commemorate God's faithfulness to his people to deliver them from slavery in Egypt. So when the psalmist writes these words, in his mind is God's faithfulness in delivering them from Egypt. And I mention this because... This is significant because, as many people have pointed out, uh, this exact song, as well as the other five, would probably have been the last songs that Jesus ever sang before the Passion, before his crucifixion, before his trial. So it's very likely that, as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus stood trial, as Jesus went to the cross, he had these exact words going through his mind. Uh, and then just another comment that I want to make is, you know, as I really studied this psalm and, and thought through it, uh, this is such a, such a God-centered psalm. And, you know, I, I think sometimes that uh, when we look at the Bible, when we approach Scripture, uh, at least for me, sometimes our, our first tendency is to say, what does this mean for me? What is this teaching me about me? And I think that the best way to understand the psalm is to, to first ask the question, what is this teaching about God? And then... How should we live in light of that? How should we live in light of what this great text has to say about God and who he is? So I'm going to invite you to, to delve into this text and to see God with me and to see him revealed in all of his glory. And then at the end to, to ask the question, how should we live in light of this? Uh, so we're going to look at it in three parts today. And the first is going to be, uh, the, the first point is a God worthy of praise. A God worthy of praise. You know, we, we see the first words in this psalm, praise the Lord, three words, very common. It's very much in the Christian vernacular, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord, brother, that's great, great to hear. And when we use this expression, we usually use it as an exclamation. Wow, praise the Lord, that's amazing. But, but make no mistake, when we read this in the psalms, this is a command. This is an imperative. This is a command to praise the Lord. And this is an important command. If any of you guys have ever taken any sort of you know, speaking or communication class in high school or in college, you'll know that the number one rule of communication is repetition. When you have something important to say, you repeat it, and you repeat it, and you repeat it. And look at the repetition in these first few verses. Praise the Lord. 
Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth and forevermore, the name of the Lord is to be praised. This is important. This is a command, and this is an important command that is worth emphasizing. And it's not just emphasized here, but all throughout the scripture, all throughout the Psalms, we are commanded to praise the Lord. And this is a command for God's people. He says, praise, O servants of the Lord. He's talking to the people of God who have been beneficiaries of his faithfulness for generations and generations from from the very beginning, from the, the exodus that the psalmist had in mind here, to right now, to today, the servants of the Lord. This is a command for you and I, a command for God's people who have been blessed by his faithfulness to respond to that in praise and in worship. And then he says, praise the name of the Lord. And this is something that we can kind of skim by sometimes because when we see name, you know, names today don't tend to have a lot of significance. Um, most of us received our names because our parents liked the way they sounded, and they probably didn't know anyone that they especially hated who had that name. <laughs> so they thought, you know, I can, name, I can name my son Jesse and not be reminded of some evil person that I know. But names haven't always been like that, and they're not like that in every culture, actually. I, I think of a, a professor that I had in college named Dr. Flies with Hawks. And she was Native American, and she wasn't born with that name, actually, but she was given that name later in life because someone determined that her personality, something about her, the way she lived, what she did, it just begged that name, Flies with Hawks, and she was, she was renamed. That name represented who she was. And names in the ancient world were a lot more like that. The name represented not just a person, but everything behind that person. It represented the person and their character, their nature, their, even their history, everything that that person did, everything that they were about. So when the psalmist tells us to praise the name of the Lord, to bless the name of the Lord, this is more than to, to merely kind of praise him with words. It's certainly not less than that, but this is a call to, to run through our minds, to think, to study, to meditate on everything that this God represents, on who he is, on what he has done, how he has revealed himself, to run that through our minds and to, to respond in praise and in worship. Praise the Lord. Praise those servants of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. And you know, the name of the Lord is such a, that's such a rich theme in scripture. This is so important. I think of, you know, the, the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Uh, the Lord's prayer. Hallowed be your name. God's name is to be honored. That first petition, a, literally a petition, a prayer for the name of God, that it would be revered, that it would be hallowed throughout all the land. Bless the name of the Lord. This is important. This is a rich biblical theme. From this time forth and forevermore, he calls on God's people to praise God's name, to bless God's name from this time forth forevermore. There is no expiration date on this imperative. Today we are commanded to praise the Lord when God delivered his people from Egypt, they were commanded to praise the Lord. Tomorrow, we will be commanded to praise the Lord. And 10 billion years from now, in a new heavens and a new earth, in the presence of God, we are no less bound to this imperative, this command to praise the Lord. And then he goes on and he says, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Or the NIV says, from the rising of the sun to the place that it sets. And this is a, an ancient kind of an idiomatic way of saying from east to west, everywhere that the sun shines, geographically, wherever the sun shines, God's name is to be praised. So the beginning of this psalm, the psalmist was emphasizing the people of God. The people of God are to praise God for his faithfulness, but now he's emphasizing the, the universality of this command, that this is not a command merely for the people of God. This is a command for everything in all of creation Everything that is not God has been created for the purpose of praising God. I think of uh, probably one of the most famous confessions in Christianity is called the Westminster Confession. In the very first words of it, it says, what is the chief end of man? The answer, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's another way of saying to praise the Lord. All of creation is to praise the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the place that it sets, from east to west, everywhere where the sun shines, we are commanded to praise the Lord. One Christian author uh, wrote a, a book about missions, and in it he made this 
famous statement. He said, evangelism is not supreme because people are not supreme, but worship is supreme because God is supreme. And what he meant by that in the whole crux of his book was that the primary, most foundational motivation to reach the nations with Christ, to reach the nations with the gospel, to reach our neighbors with the gospel, the, the most foundational motivation of that is that people in the world are not obeying this universal imperative to praise God, that nations and people are not giving God the worship that he is due. And this is why we bring the gospel to them, so that they may praise the Lord, that they may obey this imperative. This is a universal imperative. We are to praise God for what he has done, but we are also to praise God because of who he is. Simply by nature of who he is, he is worthy of praise, a God worthy of praise. So Lighthouse Church, I just ask you, is that, is that what we do? Do our lives obey this command? Are our lives uh, marked by a continual praise and worship of a creator who is worthy of all of it? Let's look at the second point now. A God transcended above creation. God transcendent above creation. So the psalmist shifts gears a little bit and he goes to the why. Why should we praise the Lord? Verse 4, he says, The Lord is high above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. Um, I want you to think with me for a second about nations. Think about the power of nations. You know, we don't have to think very far. Just think back to just a short handful of decades ago to World War II. Uh, They estimate that in World War II, there were between 50 and 80 million deaths. That's staggering. I live in Los Angeles, the second biggest city in America. We have 4 million people. 50 to 80 million deaths at the hands of nations. Entire cities and villages and towns, ancient European cities, just laid waste at the hands of nations. But what are nations to God? Verse 4, he looks far down on the nations. He sits high above all nations. Listen to the words of the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 40, verses 15 to 17, he said this, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. This God is transcendent above creation. To God, nations, the most powerful human force we can think of. To our God, nations are, they are like nothing. I think of in the Old Testament, nations like Babylon. They were an instrument that God used to discipline his people. Like I use pliers at work. God uses nations to accomplish his purposes. God is above creation. God is beyond creation. To God, nations are small. Nations are weak. Nations are like nothing. They are instruments for his purposes. And the psalmist can't help but ask this rhetorical question in verse 5. Who is like the Lord our God? Indeed, a God transcendent above creation. Who is like this God? And one thing really stood out to me in that question, as we were studying this God who is so far above us, so far above the nations, notice this this little three-letter word, our God. This great and glorious God, he is our God. He has given himself to us. We are his, he is ours. He is our God. And it it says he is seated on high. And this signifies authority. We're meant to think of a throne when we see this. I think of, you know, TV shows or movies where the president of the United States, you know, there's like a crisis, and the president is just running around, his phone is always ringing, he's always having meetings with the chief of staff and everyone else is in his cabinet. He's always stressed out. This is not our God, though. Our God is high above the nations, and he's seated. He's at peace. He has perfect authority, and his authority goes unchallenged. God is not stressed out. As he governs this universe, he is seated. He is at peace. Verse 6 says, he looks far down on the heavens and the earth. 
uh, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, I live in Los Angeles. I'm always amazed when I, whenever I've flown into LAX, see this huge, gigantic, sprawling, spread out city that I sit on the freeways in the city for hours because it's so huge and traffic is so bad. I'm trying to get from one place to another, and when I descend upon it from a few thousand feet up, it's small. It's tiny. I fly in and I, I'm amazed. I like what? There's Northridge. There's Santa Monica. It took me two hours to drive there the other day. But from here, it's like there to there, there to there. It's tiny. God looks far down on the heavens and the earth. You know, I'm, I'm not a scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm pretty proficient at Googling things. And according to my Google research, scientists are telling us right now that the observable universe, that's a really key word too, the observable universe, just the little section of it that we know about, saying that the observable universe right now is 93 billion light years in diameter. <laughs> we don't even have a frame of reference to comprehend that kind of size. We, we don't even have the mental furniture to be able to wrap our minds around 93 billion light years. The Earth on that scale is like a grain of sand in the ocean. It is microscopic. And this is what our God looks far down on. To God, nations are as nothing. A 93 billion light year in diameter universe is nothing. He looks far down on it. To God, he sees a 93 billion light year in diameter universe like we might see Los Angeles from an airplane. To God, this universe is small. The most powerful human force we can think of nations are as nothing to God. The biggest thing we could ever even wish to comprehend, to God, it's nothing. He looks far down on it. Uh, if you have a New American Standard Bible, it would say, he humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in earth. And that's actually a much closer translation to the original. The, the idea is that for this God, even to look upon, even to behold the heavens and the earth that he made is an act of profound humility and condescension. The word literally means to humiliate or to abase. Our God is transcendent above creation. He has to humble himself merely to look upon this universe. 93 billion light years in diameter. He has to humble, even humiliate himself to look upon it. Is this your God, Lighthouse Church? Is this how you think of your God? A God who humbles himself to look upon the universe? A God to whom nations are as nothing? A God to whom the universe is small? This is God. This is, as the psalmist says, this is our God. But he doesn't stop there. He, he shifts gears. And in verses 7 to 9, we see that this great and glorious God is not only a God transcendent above creation, but this is a God near to the poor and the lowly. Verses 7 to 9, you might say that we, we shift gears from the vertical to the horizontal. You could say from the astronomical to the personal. Because the psalmist sets up this amazing scale. He, he sets us up, in a sense, above the heavens and the earth. We go and we see that this God looks far down on the nations, on the heavens and the earth, but then he kind of zooms in through the solar system, through the galaxies, and he lands on people. And not just celebrities and kings and rulers and judges, but the poor and the lowly and the afflicted. Verses 7 and 8 says, He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. To make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. This God who looks upon the heavens and the earth as small has gone so low as to exalt the poor and the lowly. I want you to think back for a second about that story I told at the beginning, my, my brief encounter with the president. I want you to imagine again the President of the United States in his motorcade, 
Police officers, motorcycles, cop cars, sirens blaring, helicopters, snipers on rooftops, and the President of the United States says, stop, stop the cars, stop the motorcycles, I need to get out. And he opens up the door to his armored limousine and he gets out of his car and he goes to the homeless community of San Francisco. And he says, guys, I want you to come to dinner with me tonight. I have a dinner tonight with all of my donors. Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, rich, powerful, world changers, entrepreneurs, businessmen, politicians. I want you to come with me to dinner tonight. I want you to sit at the same table with me, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg. Leave your sleeping bags behind and come with me. Well, on a much more glorious and cosmic scale, that's what we read about our God. Our God is one who is powerful, transcendent above all creation, and yet he has stooped to the level of the lowest of the low. Notice that it, it doesn't say that he merely tolerates the poor and the lowly. He doesn't set them on a level playing field, he exalts them. He raises them up. And he makes them sit with princes, the princes of his people. And I love that it specifies not just any princes, but the princes of his people, because God doesn't merely exalt these people, but he exalts them and he adopts them. He makes them his own. He adopts them as a king, and he sets them with the princes of his people. And then verse 9. You know, it might seem like kind of an anticlimactic way to end such a glorious psalm that sets us up above the heavens and the earth and makes us look at the universe and all of its majesty. And then it ends on this note of the barren woman. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. But you see, that really completes this whole thing because... In this context, to be a barren woman was to be the very lowest of the low. This was the bottom rung of society. This was a highly patriarchal society. And to be a barren woman in the ancient Near East was to be thought of as practically useless. And this God reaches to the bottom rung of the societal ladder and he blesses the barren woman. Scripture has a rich tradition of God blessing the barren woman. Uh, we could look no further than Sarah, the, this key player in the story of redemption and God's plan to redeem sinful people. And he began it with this barren woman, Sarah, in the Old Testament. Who is like the Lord our God? This psalm would teach us that no one is so high as to reach God's transcendent majesty and yet no one is so low as to escape God's imminent mercy. Amen. Amen, indeed. Who is like the Lord our God? So Lighthouse Church, where does this leave us? Where does this leave us? How does a, a Tuesday morning at, at work, Saturday evening with the family, Thursday afternoon, how does that look different in light of the truth of Psalm 113? Well, you know, there's so many ways that we could apply this text, but uh, I just want to give you three points of application, three things to be thinking about as we think about this glorious God. First, Psalm 113 should compel us to pray. It should compel us to pray. Because when you pray, you can know that you're praying to a God who is transcendent above all creation. This is a God to whom nations are weak, to whom the universe is small, a God to whom nations are, are instruments in the hands of his purposes. When you pray, you can know that this God is perfectly capable of answering your prayer. You know, I, I have a lot of good friends. I'm very blessed. And if for some reason I were ever to get into financial trouble, I have no doubt that many of my friends would be eager to help me out. The problem is most of my friends are just as broke as I am. <laughs> they would... <laughs> They would not have any ability to help me out. They just don't have the resources. 
But friends, God has every resource. God created resources. Nations are at his disposal. The universe is small. When you pray to this God, you can know that he is perfectly able to answer your prayer. And at the same time, you can know that this God has concerned himself with your well-being. This God has condescended, humbled himself as to be concerned for your well-being. So you can know that when you pray, you pray to a God who is perfectly able to answer your prayers and a God who has given himself to you. Again, you know, if I were to pray, uh, if, I, if I were to get into financial trouble, I have no doubt that Elon Musk would be able to help me out. <laughs> the problem is I, he's not concerned with my well-being. He's not aware of my being, period. He doesn't even know who I am and never will. But this God has concerned himself with your well-being. He knows you. He knows who you are. And he has concerned himself for you. And the flip side of that is that if, he, if God hasn't answered your prayers, you can know it's not because he is incapable and it's not because he's not concerned for you. So he has his purposes. Secondly, Psalm 113 should give great comfort in times of trial. Um, I helped out at a Bible study at UCLA, and several months ago I was walking back from Bible study with a student from the Bible study, and uh, someone came up to us. He's like, hey, you know, I'm looking for such and such hall. If you guys direct me. We're like, hey, we're, we're heading that way now. Come follow us. Come walk with us. He's like, oh, great. So we started walking with this guy. Really nice guy. We got to know him a little bit. He was a freshman philosophy student in Australia, and he said, so, you know, what, what's you guys' story? What do you guys do? And I said, well, I'm, I'm actually not a student at UCLA. Um, I'm in grad school. I, st I study theology. And he was really interested in that. And he said, Frank, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah, of course. He said, what do you do with the problem of evil? And I said, you know, I'm going to be honest with you, man. That's probably the hardest question you could have asked me. And I um, gave him somewhat of a, you know, kind of what the Bible would say about things like that. And then, and then he said, well, what do you do about people suffering? In other words, why does this person suffer and this person is blessed? Why is this person thriving and this person is suffering? And that could be some of you here today. And if you're suffering today, I don't know why specifically that is. But Psalm 113 would, would tell you that if you are suffering today, it is not because God has lost control of your life. Because a God to whom nations are weak, a God to whom the universe is small, a God who has to humble himself merely to look upon the heavens and the earth, this God has never and will never and can never lose control over anything. If you are suffering today, it is not because God has lost control of your life. And secondly, if you are suffering today, it is not because God is indifferent to your pain. Because God has reached so far down as to exalt the poor and the lowly and to bless the barren woman. So if you are suffering today, you can know that it is not because God has lost control of your life, and it is not because God is indifferent. But thirdly, and, and finally, the final application of this text is really the application to every text in all the Bible. If you look, this text ends the same way it begins, with that three-word imperative, to praise the Lord. So Lighthouse Church as you believe today, the way to apply this text is to, to think, to meditate on who this God is, how he has revealed himself, everything that he has done, a God worthy of praise, a God transcendent above creation, and a God near to the poor and the lowly, and to simply praise him for it, to give thanks to him for it, because he is worthy. Praise him for who he is and for what he has done. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we do indeed praise you. Who is like you, Lord? No one is like you, Father. You are so far beyond us, so far above us, so separate from us, and yet so near to us, God. No one is like you. We praise you, Father, for who you are and for what you have done. Bless this service. Bless these people here. I praise you, God, for this church, this body. Father, bless this church, and may this church bless you and praise your name. Amen. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
that hits the mark. It's how God created us to be. Thank you for picking out, for God leading you to pick out.